he's so so vain. He's he's so so vain. Aloha again, everyone. Jeremy Vaney here, and you are watching. Uh, what are you watching? Oh, that's right. You already know because you uh, saw the title screen. He's so vain. I, I won't bore you with the details. Um, maybe I will bore you with the details. This has turned into a trilogy on metamaterials or metametals in ufology. The first being a, a look at Diana Pasulka's claims, the second Gary Nolan, and here we are with Jacques Vallée. And I should say that um, of the three, Jacques Vallée is, uh, how you say, a sacred cow for me personally. Um, I grew up reading his books, and I thought and still think that they are some of the best and arguably the best literature on uh, the UFO phenomenon. Um, so w when he started doing the metamaterial rounds, um, I was skeptical, to say the least. Um, but I don't think that it um, negates any of the good work that he has done in the past. So for those of you who are waiting for me to, you know, say that, just waiting to hear me say whether I throw out all of Jacques Vallée's work because of this crap, I don't. But I think we do deserve answers to what this crap is about. And I'm not going to make this a long, belabored thing the way I did the Gary Nolan one, because it doesn't need to be that. Actually, there is, um, uh, 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 what is this website? douglasjohnson.ghost.io is the website, and uh, it's. I'll have a link to it in, in this show description. He wrote an article in uh, January 2024 called Crash Story File Witness, in quotes, Credibility Implodes for Jacques Vallée's Trinity UFO Crash Tale. Now, this is a long read, and it, um, I think, is a follow-up to um, something he had written earlier. And, and so in this version, Jacques Vallée has actually um, answered some of his concerns. Um, but it, from the, from the first, uh, iteration of this or the first, I'm unclear as I'm doing this now, I, I don't, I, I think it was an earlier article. It's not just an expanded upon article, but either way, Jacques Vallée answered his original piece and, um, both, uh, Johnson here Douglas Dean Johnson and I, uh, agree that his responses are quite lacking. So, um, Douglas Dean Johnson, to my eye, um, and this was updated February 28th, 2025. No, it wasn't, Douglas. <laughs> it was updated February 28th, 2024, maybe? But, uh, not 2025. Come on. <laughs> All right, this doesn't bode well for me saying that this guy just debunked Jacques Vallée, but I promise you, <laughs> if you read this article, um, it's it's a done deal. I mean, the witness's credibility does fall apart. And I remember, I think it was a video with Bob Salas, and I, I, I looked for it, and I'll continue to look for it um, to splice it in here if I can, but I, I can't find it because I don't think the title of the video had to do with this, but just in the interview he was talking about that he had seen the Trinity evidence or he, and, or, I mean, definitely had talked to the witnesses and thought that they were liars. So, and I'm pretty sure that was Robert Solace. If I am wrong, um, someone out there, correct me, but I just remember it was someone who I find to be a credible person saying this and he's the only person I can think of. And he's the one I have a visual memory of saying it. So, uh, let's hope all of that is correct. Um, so all of this is to say that this Trinity UFO crash, uh, that he wrote a book with Paula Harris about, uh, is sheer nonsense. And I knew it was nonsense, um, from the word go, so I never even read it. And the reason I knew it was nonsense is because one, another Roswell-like crash from back then, no, nah. but two, this was until Jacques Vallée attached himself to it, a case uh, purely of Paula, who I refer to lovingly as Paola, 
Harris, um, who never met a fraud she didn't like. I mean, she supports uh, Stephen Greer. She supports the Billy Meyer UFO case. She claims she saw NASA documents that backed up the Billy Meyer UFO case, which uh, don't exist. Um, she uh, supports, um, you know, Phil Corso and, um, you know, on and on. She's trash, as far as I'm concerned in this field. She is uh, one of the people who provides crap. And she may do it in a nice way. She may be a super friendly person. She may mean it. It may really come from the heart, this investigative journalism. <laughs> but that can't seem to sniff out frauds. Uh, but it's, it's, it's useless nonetheless. And she's notorious. So it's not like people don't know this. In fact, I found... As I was going through to gear up to do a culture of contact video series, I went back into my old emails. I was looking for like old graphics and I forgot that way back when, like in 2008, for some reason I got onto a UFO like insider email list, which was like everyone who's anyone in ufology pretty much was on this list. And, um, for some reason I was one of those people. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot this, but this just shows you the memory hole of ufology here. Um, but anyway, I, I read this exchange I had with Paula Harris where, I mean, I was just cruel to her. But so even back then it was like, um, and it was cruel on behalf of, um, I think the Meyer thing and also her, you know, talking about what a wonderful person Stephen Greer is. And he never claimed that he, you know, rocked a hu uh, an alien baby in his arms at a military base or whatever it was he said at a conference. Although I don't think he said rocked a baby in his arms. I think he implied it by gesturing, rocking a baby in his arms. But anyway, we had a, a back and forth. And that, of course, was the Atacama mummy, which turns out to be a human. Um, and so everyone on that list knows, like Jacques Vallée knows is my point. I know that Jacques Vallée knows that she is someone the likes of which Jacques Vallée should not be wanting to work with. And yet, um, somehow he seeks her out. Let's, let's listen to how they, uh, met up here from Paula Harris. And I, like I said, I'm not going to belabor the point on any of this. Oh, and I guess the other thing I should mention is that, again, I don't want to know any of this stuff outside of doing these three videos. <laughs> So what I didn't know, like in being so far behind in not learning about these people is that like, it's already kind of common knowledge, I guess, that Gary Nolan was James. The other, there were Tyler and James who were the two people involved with Diana Pasolka. I thought these two men, uh, chloroformed her and dragged her into the desert, but what they, <laughs> but apparently it was just Tyler who didn't chloroform her, but blindfolded her and James and drag them out into the desert. And lo and behold, um, by all accounts, um, James is Gary Nolan. So it's Gary Nolan and Diane Pasolka who are dragged out. So to look at these meta metals in the desert. So has Gary Nolan already debunked those meta metals? And like how many meta metals have to get debunked before like Diane Pasolka is like, oh, wait a minute, I got brought into this field. How? This is weird. Uh, but no, they, he debunks them. He, he sees that they're terrestrial in nature and, uh, onward they go pretending as though aliens are, it's hundred percent aliens are here. I shouldn't say they, but Gary Nolan, um, pretending that it's hundred percent alien and they're here and, and all of this. And it's like, again, it, your evidence is panning out. Maybe it's time to look elsewhere, but Right now, let's take a look at uh, Paula Harris telling us how she and Jacques Vallée hooked up uh, for, for their garbage. This is a video, Grant Cameron with Jacques Vallée and Paula Harris on Trinity, their new book by Grant Cameron, White House UFO. Is that right? Am I reading that right? <laughs> Grant Cameron, White House UFO. Okay. Um, this was, I remember, I've seen this before and so I know I'm just going to fast forward to a few parts I want you to notice. And this was the other reason, besides my intuiting that this is all garbage, I then saw this interview, which was um, either right before the book came out or as the book came out. And I said, wait a minute, Jacques Vallée, didn't you just debunk your own book before it even came out? Here's Paul Harris. 
to talk about how we came together to do the book. Now, I was working on this in 2009 on my own and had gone to San Antonio, New Mexico, uh, interviewing both little boys. Then Jacques. When she says interviewing both little boys, what she means is both old men. There's a theory going around and someone emailed me about this just like a couple of days ago. Um, and, but I just want you to know person who emailed me, you're not the only person who's emailed me this, that maybe Jacques is just getting old and maybe he's losing a step. And like, you're allowed to screw up once in a while. Like you can be a legend in the field and, for good reason and still screw up. But I maintain that when you watch this video or any interviews with them where they're talking about these two elderly men, both he and Paula Harris continuously refer to them as boys, little boys. So we're supposed to picture them as little boys because we're supposed to think like little boys don't lie, but old men talking about their childhoods do. So that to me seems like a coordinated planned effort to message something. That doesn't sound like old guy got it wrong. Maybe that's just me. Will you talk about how you were working on it and we came together to work on it? I had been, um, people have accused me of not paying enough attention to UFO crashes and to recovery of materials and so on. And that's a valid accusation. And I plead guilty um, for a long time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a computer scientist and that's what I, what I can bring to a team that does this kind of research. I have no illusion of solving the UFO problem by myself, but I can contribute an analysis so I've been concentrating on looking for patterns of large numbers of cases across the world. And when, when I used to discuss, you know, Roswell and other cases like Roswell with Dr. Hynek, the discussion always came to the fact that we didn't have enough data. We didn't have, there were references, but the witnesses were afraid. We didn't know their names. We didn't know where they had gone. It was hard to trace anything down and in, in actual physical reality that we could take to the scientific um, to the, to scientific opinion, to the scientific community. Oh, but also Jacques, many of those witnesses um, who at least that you know Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt had interviewed. Remember when they used to trot out, if anyone remembers this in the 80s, like it was like 50 witnesses to Roswell or whatever it is. Most of those got whittled away. They turned out to be lying. They turned out to be wrong, like demonstrably not where they said they were, you know. Um, so there's that. When I became aware of uh, some of the more recent research, of course, now we're better equipped to do research and to do a real analysis of samples. And I've been working with a small group of, of scientists, both in France, and, and in the US, um, starting to look at those samples. And that led me to go into, into uh, looking at sites like a site near Detail in New Mexico. I knew New Mexico a little bit and I, I love that state because it's so spectacular. There's such a variety of cultures, a variety of traditions and um, and of course, many reports of UFOs concentrated, especially in, in the late mid to late forties like Roswell. So there is a lot of work to be done there. And uh, I had been looking at a site near Detail in New Mexico where we actually dug up and went there several times with um, a, a friend of mine who lived and worked in, in New Mexico his family had long, long history in the state with cattle and with, with other, other work in the state. So we... Let's find out that's Tyler. <laughs> that would really just complete the circle, wouldn't it? I was becoming familiar with the, the challenges of uh, trying to reconstruct 
what had gone on with those crashes that the UFO literature talks about. And uh, the, the friend who had uh, been with me at uh, Detail took me to uh, San Antonio, New Mexico, not San Antonio, Texas, San Antonio, New Mexico, where um, he told me that a case, a remarkable case had happened in 1945 that very, very few people knew about. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed before we could go to the site together. He had started to, uh, it was killed in a, in a car, you know, with a car accident. So not Tyler. Um, before we could actually go to the site together. But then I became aware that uh, Paula had been doing research on that case. And I immediately said, hmm, this case is suspect because Paul is doing it. Because I know that Paula Harris latches on to really bad cases. In fact, the whole reason I haven't been dealing in meta metals and Roswell and all that is because I kind of suspect it's garbage. I don't actually believe that the phenomenon works that way. I don't think it's uh, necessarily a, a materialist ordeal. Um, or to the extent that it is materialist, it's temporary, it's, it's got an ability to pop in and out of reality, in and out of existence, but that's not really the way to look, Jacques Vallée said to no one in this interview. But that's been Jacques Vallée's stance since forever. And that's how he influenced so many people to believe outside of the realm of aliens and materialist nonsense. I digress. For four or five years before I even became aware of it. So we were connected by a, a common friend who was a, a researcher in Los Angeles. And then I, um, I had to, to start uh, catching up with uh, what Paola had been doing. And uh, the, the case is unique. It is incredible. I just got a, a message from a, a, an executive in Silicon Valley who said, if it wasn't you guys writing this book, I'm halfway through it and I would ask for my money back. You may want to consider that anyway. Uh, let's move on. He's right about one thing. This is incredible. Now, you, you sort of stole my next question, which goes to the, the, the idea that you brought up that if a uh, very advanced civilization were to come here and crash, it uh, doesn't make any sense, or the fact that they would not have recovered their own craft immediately. Because we, if we have a, uh, a craft down, and my father was with accident investigation in the Canadian government, and I know he talked about the one time a U-2 was down, that the uh, American military was there before the Canadians got there. So the, this goes to the question of, you, you mentioned this thing about the gifting. And in a recent interview, Bob Bigelow, who's a friend of yours, was being interviewed by George Knapp and he was asked about Roswell and he said, well, yeah, there's Roswell. Then there was, there were, I think there was one in Russia and there was one in China and there was one in South America. And I think they're seeding them. And Tyler D who I think you are also know referred to this other crash site in New Mexico as the gifting field. And this yes. goes to your little pieces of metal, which also don't make sense to me is that little pieces of metal are falling out of the sky that this advanced craft comes from wherever it's coming from. And then little pieces start falling off it where you get the memory metal that you couldn't bend with a sledgehammer. You could, it would deflect bullets, but when it, you, when it hits the ground, it shatters like a, a wine glass. It sort of gives the indication that, we are being gifted this material. Do you believe that that there may be part of that, that we are being given some assistance in terms of um, understanding that we aren't alone and that the world is more complex than we think it is? Um, I, I think I, I may have been the one who started that idea that it was a, a donation. Well, that's interesting. So first of all, he knows Tyler, the, the no, notorious Tyler in quotes, Tyler D. Um, he also knows David Grush. I believe he is part of the Soul Foundation, not to be confused with the Soul Foundation. There's one Soul Foundation that does like tree planting stuff, and there's another Soul Foundation that does like looking into metametals and UFO stuff. And um, that's like David Grush, Jacques Vallée, Gary Nolan, Diana Pasulka. You know, it's the new old boys club now featuring Diana Pasulka. And 
it would be very easy for me to say that all of this nonsense is simply about getting funding for that, but nowhere on their website do they say who funded them or who's been funding them so far. So maybe they're putting in their own money, um, or maybe they're getting it from Bigelow, who's getting it from the government. I, I, maybe they're getting grants. I, I don't know. I don't know what their situation is. They haven't made that public as far as I can tell. Um, but I, I also know that in ufology, uh, groups tend to form and attach big names to them who then go on to do nothing for the group other than have their big name attached to it. So it's also possible that nothing will come of the Soul Foundation in any long lasting way. Um, as so many groups have gone by like that, like just big flashy, like, look who's attached to us. And then nothing happens because they're not really doing anything. Could be that. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what is motivating these people to study metamaterials that then don't pan out and then they continue to go on to study metamaterials. I, I just, I don't get this, but I do know that it is odd to me <laughs> and suspicious to me that they're all using the same new language, right? Gifting and Jacques, Jacques here is saying, I think it was my idea that they were, it was gifted. I don't think so. I think that was, you may have used the term first, but like I said before, uh, Whitley wrote that in, um, his novel Majestic about the Roswell crash. Um, the idea that they planted materials in bodies to see what we would do with them. Um, now, uh, if you're going to say that they're gifting all of these governments around the world, that's a lot of gifting. Like that's to, to have covered up for all these years, all of these governments in the same exact way. And for no one to have mentioned it until now in these other countries. Um, like, no, I guess my, my answer is no, no, that that's not happening. But anyway, that's not Jacques answer. So let's hear what he has to say. You know, that they dangle something. I mean, look at what we can do. Because uh, on the last day, uh, let's jump to the last day. Now, the, the, the thing has been recovered after bringing an 18-wheeler to recover the weather balloon and building a crane, a special crane, to lift the thing and put it on the truck. They put it on the, the low boy that's you know, behind the truck and they put it sideways well why sideways well it's egg shaped and if it's if it's upside you know if it's if it's up it's not going to go under the overpass on the highway to take it back to white sands so they put it sideways and then the everything is under top and the soldiers are happy they go to the local bar there nothing can happen to it except that the two kids are still there and they say we need a souvenir. Now, when, when I I spoke, uh, you know, with Paola, we spoke to Mr. Padilla, whom we've gotten to know very well by now. Uh, just a footnote here that in that article I'm citing, there's a link to a video of Mr. Padilla, who he's gotten to know very well, along with Paula, uh, to his son. Uh, it's body cam footage from a cop. I don't know what the context is, if they're just chit chatting or if the cop was called. I'm not sure, but, uh, he's telling the cop, you know, my father is a pathological liar, right? Like, and they live together, by the way, the Padilla and his son. And he's telling him all the things that he lied about. One of which is like, you know, he's he claims he was in the Korean war, but he's been deaf in one ear since he was a kid. He couldn't get into the army. Uh, he lied about being a cop in California. He's like going down this list of lies. Um, so I guess, Jacques and Paula, in getting to know Jose, didn't interview his son, with whom he lives, about his, as he said, pathological lying? Hmm. Uh, after a few years. Um, you know, that idea of a souvenir, I mean, why a souvenir? Why was it so important? Well, in every family, there were people who were not coming back from Germany or not coming back from Poland, not coming back from, from other places around the world, in Japan and so on. So souvenirs were very important. If you had something that had belonged to, to the father, to the uncle, to, you know, to someone in your family, a brother, you wanted to keep something, it was very important. That was the only thing that you would get back. And um, 
so the, the kids knew that and they wanted to get a souvenir, so they went inside. In fact, this is also the only case where three people have gone inside a, a UFO, an empty craft. Except read the article, this never happened. Without being abducted, to investigate it, to measure it, to see what it was made of, what it was like inside. Now the last day it's sideways, so the kids can see the can see under the thing. The thing is about 15 feet high, okay? And the where the Mr. Padilla was walking as, as a kid when he went inside, um, he he said that the the height was about 12 to 13 feet. I asked, well, how did you, did you know that? I mean, you were a nine-year-old, you know, how do you know? Well, he said, that's, that's uh, the size of a beam. If you build a new house, you know, that's just the, the, the size of the average beam. Well, these kids were smart. They were smart because they grew up by themselves in the middle of a war. They had to take responsibility for what they did. You know, they were not playing around. They were not doing what you know your kids or my kids are doing they they had to work they had to serve they had to and so we we know those dimensions pretty well well under the floor which was flat there was another three feet well what was in there i mean if if you're looking for where the propulsion system is which i think that's what you know people in those different agencies are looking for right now what are we even talking about here jacques how did you know how high it was well because i know how high uh eye beams are oh that's brilliant because you know kids these days they're not as smart as they were back then so anyway there was a space in the floor of this imaginary situation i'm describing what could have been in there oh i don't know uh, a propulsion system you know let me let me digress here that the, you know, the, the military is often looking for the propulsion system of these things. They might, might want to look under the floor. <laughs> they might want to kick open the floorboards. You know, it's like a Rivian. You know, it's like one of them electric cars where they got like the, the skateboard platform and all the batteries are on top of that. They're not in the front engine and they're not in the back. It's like that. It's like that. You know, uh, there was no opening. There was just just about three feet by something like ten feet maybe of of space where if we think of it as a propulsion system, it had to be there. And there are no openings and there is no smoke coming out, there is no sound coming out of it, you know. What was it? You know, what can we learn from this? Okay. So those are some of the questions. So as as Paula and I, you know. Those are some of the questions of this imaginary situation that didn't happen. I mean, I, I really don't know what to say here. Uh, I, I, I'm tempted to do a montage, by the way, of every time that they say kids, kid, kids, kids, these kids, these kids, these boys, these kids, these boys, these young boys. Um, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It'll be a mystery to both of us or all of us. Hopefully there's more than one of you listening. Anyway, I'm going to skip ahead to my favorite and last part where Jacques Vallée debunks all of this mess. So what happened, and I'll add Jacques, the, the little boy walked in, he wanted a souvenir, and what he saw was a plaque on the wall. And the plaque looked like he didn't see any nails or anything, and it had a round circle that, had, that looked like copper. In the middle was this, what Jacques and I call a bracket. Uh, it looked like a some kind of handle or whatever, and it would rotate. And so that is what um, uh, Jose, and it was just Jose that went inside because Remy handed him the crowbar to pull the bracket off the inside. What's unique about this case is that we have the witnesses, the location, and a substantial piece of metal. Keeping in mind that that very witness, who's the only witness to have pried this bracket off of the interior of a UFO, uh, his own son says he's a pathological liar. Um, when I first started working with them, 
uh, I had seen the bracket at, in Gig Harbor, Washington at the home of Remy Baca. Who had been there was Timothy Good. So Timothy Good had this case in his book, plus he had done some analysis on the bracket. Uh, the other person that mentioned this case and we want to give credit to is Ryan Wood, who has the book Magic Eyes Only, that has 93 cases. That book is, for me, a reference book. So Jacques and I looked at that because 1945 is in there. So we have this piece of metal called the bracket. And then when Remy passes on, Jose gets the bracket. And, and I'm working with this thing. And I put it in a safe deposit box here in Colorado. Uh, I'm working with this thing. What did Timothy Good do? What did, did he not look at the bracket? Remy's got a bracket, so we're told. But she only sees it because Jose's got it. Jose's the pathological liar. Uh, now she's got it in a safe deposit box or something, hiding amongst her goods in the background there. I don't know what. <laughs> I'm sure we'll find out. And because he gives it to me, he gives me gifts. He gave me that gift. He, he, gi he, he gifted her the gift of an alien artifact. And her response is like, oh, I know what to do with this. A safe deposit box. This is the biggest story in the history of uh, humankind, blah, blah, blah. And um, this, is, this is the importance uh, with which it is uh, handled. And speaking of handled, um, I don't hear anyone wearing hazmat suits when they're handling these materials. So I guess movies and TV have lied to me again about how appropriate it would be to you know, when, when handling alien material, make sure that it's not uh, irradiating you or giving you some sort of alien virus or disease or, you know, nanobots under your skin, something. Uh, it's cool to just pick things up, wrap them up in a bow and give them to Paul Harris. <laughs> That's my plan. If I ever come across any metamentals. When I met... Jacques, I gave him, quote unquote, the bracket. And, and, and that is what, you know, it's amazing that you haven't gone there because most of the UFO researchers, all they care about is the metal and the bracket. But let me, let me add one thing, uh, Jacques, I have here a souvenir. This is the cane of Mama Grande, the Apache. It says uh, Maria Amanda Chavez, because what Jose gave to me is her cane and what he gave to um, Jacques as a souvenir because they believe in souvenirs is a rain stick from the Apache and a series of cufflinks that have, uh, what do you call it, pistols on them. This is how these people think. These people, huh? Uh, I, I don't know what the hell's going on anymore in this. I just know that this pathological liar, allegedly, is handing out gifts. And he's saying they're from, like, tribes or something. And Paula Harris is like, oh, tribes? I know what tribes are, huh? I'll take that. <laughs> uh, I, I, can't, I can't imagine Jacques Vallée and Paula Harris sitting down to write a book together and work on a case. That, that just boggles the mind. But okay. So, uh, you know, for me to have this, to have had the bracket, and then I gave it to Jacques, and you can, you can ask the metal questions now if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I can, I can, I can it, speak to the fact that I've actually handled it. If you recall, I was in Boulder, and we went... Oh, Grant Cameron has handled the alien bracket from outer space. Apparently, everyone's handled this alien bracket except the government. And yet the government's the one hiding things and covering things up. Why don't you just put this bracket on out there for everybody? Why don't you be the disclosure that you so seek, everyone? <laughs> oh, right. You can't because it's all bullshit. Hmm. And you know who seems to know that it's bullshit? I got a feeling Grant Cameron. But he's not going to say it because he's a nicer person than I am. To those yes. people's house. And he said, where, where am I hiding it? And I said, I don't know where you're hiding it. And he pulled it out of the back of a TV. He had it hidden in the, yes, the back of the TV. Remember that? 
husband. So, so let's go to the bracket. Is that, is that, and let, let's clarify, is that the only piece of hardware? I heard one interview you guys were doing that indicated you might have more than something else. Well, I think we'll keep it vague. Okay. Yeah. Because of yeah, I think you should keep it vague because the second it becomes specific, we find out it's like from, you know, Bradley's before they shut down, you know? <laughs> There's a long history of things appearing and disappearing um, in, in various ways. So, um, you know, to be completely truthful, I would say we don't know what we have, okay? Um, people have already told us what it was, okay, that it's a, it's an ordinary piece of, you know, industrial thing, it's worth nothing. Oh, then you do know what you have. You have an old piece of industrial thing, which makes sense. That's something that Jose de Pedia might have lying around the ranch, you know? <laughs> ah! Nothing and so on. Uh, it shouldn't have been there. Uh, or they they think of some some um, you know retro gravity uh, uh, invention and so on. We we don't know, and that's the most important thing that a scientist can say. You know, is uh, we don't know. Well, unless you do know, because you're about to tell us that you do know. So if you do know, you can say you know, and then it's case closed, and you don't release the book because then you're going to look like uh, a moron. And you're Jacques Vallée, you're not a moron. So then people like me who've been following your work all of our lives are going to be like, wait a minute, Jacques Vallée is not a moron. Is he pulling a fast one here? Because I seem to remember a time when on boingboing.net, uh, you did that three or four part uh, series, written uh, essay series on, you know, the origin of crop circles that sounded so outlandish. Everyone in the comments section was like, you're full of it. And then in your, your very last you know, essay, you said, oh, surprise, I was just doing a social experiment. I was full of it. Just wanted to see what would happen here. Is that what's going on here? I hope so. I hope that there's a really good answer to this. I hope at the end of this, in a few years, we just hear surprise. We were just trying to catch hackers and spies like we used to, except now we do it online instead of you know, making up Area 51 stories through the TV. Uh, because if, if we knew there wouldn't be any point to do research, we really don't know what we have. The superficially, and, and also the interesting thing is, obviously, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley. I've lived in Silicon Valley for a long time, for over 40 years. And um, I have many friends here and I know where the bodies are buried. And I know the history of a number of companies, some of them dead. Um, and uh, so I, I have access to labs. I have access to people who have resources and instruments. But more important than that, I have access to their thinking. And I've always seen my role as being um, as serving a community of scientists from different disciplines, because no one discipline is going to have the, the key to this problem, to the UFO problem. You, 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 need, uh, you need a team of scientists who can work together. Boy, this is a lot of, uh, this is a lot of really important babble speak about his credentials and who he has access to and, and how important he is and who can get this stuff to, to just answer the question about like, so the metals, huh? This bracket, what's that? Right? Why isn't he answering it? Why are we listening to this rigmarole? But let's see how long this takes. Who can exchange information, challenge each other. And, um, and also you need, I mean, the, the computer science guy, uh, I think of myself as more of an information scientist, if you already want to. Uh, to, to pin it down uh, as sort of the connecting tissue among all of that so that when they have a question, I should be able to come up with elements that are useful in their research, which, I, and I understand the terms they use, but I couldn't do the research they do. I apologize, everyone. I said I didn't want this to be as long as the Gary Nolan episode, but Jacques is forcing my hand here. He won't just answer the fucking question. So th that is the, the condition where we are. So within 
that that atmosphere, which is typical of Silicon Valley, you know, free over breakfast, you you know, you make up something new and you look for challenges. Um, we don't agree, and that's healthy. Some of my uh, colleagues say, well, you know, it's an ordinary, we know the metal. I mean, um, you know, it was, it was analyzed, uh, Timothy Good had it analyzed. There were three analyses that were done, one in Mexico and one in the United States. And, and uh, so we know what it is. It's, it's an alloy of aluminum called silumin. Um, it's basically aluminum. Oh, so Timothy Good did do the research years ago. This is why no one's been talking about this case. But of course, we're talking about Paula Harris. So she's like, da dump, da dump, da dump, dump. I know a case. Uh, and for some reason, Jacques Vallée has attached his wagon to this donkey. I don't get it. I don't get it. But they, they add some things to the aluminum to, to make it stronger. And it's, uh, you know, there is a code for it in the met metallurgical books. Uh, and you can, you, you, can, you can buy it as, uh, as an alloy. So that is not, you know, uh, extraterrestrial material, presumably, because if, even if I made something like that, they wouldn't make it to the exact composition, you know, <laughs> that's in the industrial books that we have. But... It was pried off the inside of a UFO, Jacques. So by definition, it's alien material, Jacques. Jacques, Jacques, come back. So, it, so it's human. So what is it doing inside, you know, something that just crashed from the sky with a, an exquisite, you know, propulsion system we don't understand. Um, and why why all the mystery? with an exquisite propulsion system we don't understand except that that part the guy didn't pry out of the floor so we don't know that jacques that's part of the story of these kids these boys these young whippersnappers who are like in their 60s or 70s or something well you know my response was look guys you know the the army was far away from a source of power. They may have been able to generate power from the Jeeps. You know, I used to drive a Jeep. You know, you could, you could, you could use it to, to generate power. And that's one of the amazing things that the Jeeps do. And, but uh, the, the way it was described by Mr. Padilla, this could be something that they improvised with a bracket they had that they found somewhere. Maybe it uh, was part of the debris from the tower that the object hit, you know, there were all kinds of things. And um, that you could wrap a, a cable around it, you could use it to, maybe it was spinning around this, you know, you think of a copper circle. I mean, Paola said there was this copper, well, copper is obviously conducts uh, electricity uh, very well. And you could, if, if it spins around, it, you could generate a power, generate power, you could do something. So you start thinking about that. Oh, wait a minute. Is Jacques saying, is he working on the ET, the extraterrestrial theory, where like if you hook up like a speaking spell to an umbrella, you can contact outer space? Like if your ship crashes, is that what we're working with here, Jacques? <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand when you look at it yeah we can you can buy something very much like it in fact you know with uh, you get on ebay and and paola gave me this this is an actuator you know so it has it has a hole here it can spin and when it spins it can move things that are attached to these holes here so this is a very simple one uh, that, again you can get it get it on eBay for, you know, for a small amount of, of dollars. And there, there are many configurations of those things, except that the one we have is, doesn't have a brand, okay? If I look at this, this has a brand and it has a number inside, okay? You can read the number. So you, you, you know where it comes from and you know all of that. The, the one we have doesn't have any indication, doesn't have any markings. It looks pretty crude, but it looks like it was done just for this. 
what makes a grown man jump through these hoops to do? He doesn't need this. He's wealthy. Look at him. He's, he's got books. He's smart. <laughs> he, uh, he doesn't need this book. He doesn't need, he doesn't need to be holding up something that they bought off eBay and trying to say like, well, the alien thing was exactly this, except it didn't have a brand name or a model number on it. Uh, so it was aliens. They, maybe they made it just then with a 3D printer because they had to spin around a cable to try to jumpstart the ship. I really, as I watch this again, I feel my whole world crumbling around me. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta stop this. I gotta, uh, I gotta start doing the culture contact thing. You know, um, that's what I'm going to be focusing on now because someone has to replace this shit and not with Vulger's crystals with something that is again, you know, Jacques here has, has lost the thread. I'm sorry, Jacques, you've lost the fucking thread. So I, I'm going to pick that thread up. If you can get on eBay. Um, and, uh, I'm going to, hopefully, if I'm any good at what I do, give you different ways to think deeply about these subjects. Uh, because that's what we used to go to people like Jacques for, and he is no longer with us. So, uh, yeah. If you want to, uh, be a part of that, um, it'll be free on YouTube or whatever, but um, go to ko-fi.com backslash jve and uh, sign up there. And then that way I can put you on the Discord and maybe we can have a little discourse beforehand. I can do some live chats and you'll know when I'm going live through that. Um, yeah, this ended in a self-promotion for my future projects because um, I, I can't look to the past anymore. It's all dead to me. Is it as dead for you as it is for me? Because this is... This is wholly disappointing. The other thing is that also it's in the metric system. Well, metric system 1945 in the middle of New Mexico would be pretty unusual. Okay, I'm done. Uh, so the aliens uh, use the metric system. I'm done. I'm done. I, I can't even... I'm sure there, there was more to this that I, I wanted to share with you. But I, I just, I, I'm done sharing, all right? I gotta go cry now. Okay, goodbye. He I keep trying to tell people this is all real. Nobody believes me, but you know what, Paul? I have a NASA document. It says NASA document, all right? Can I see that? Well, there's nothing in it now, oh, but there was look. a fax document from NASA. <laughs> Oh, if only you knew what a dead-on impersonation this was. <laughs> he's, he's so, so very...